Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the Atheist Alliance International Podcast. I'm Jason Sylvester, a.k.a. Diogenes of Mayberry. And as always, I'd like to remind everyone, please like and subscribe. And this week, we're joined by Professor David Ornstein, who is a professor of anthropology at the City University of New York. Hello, David. Thank you Hi. for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's wonderful to be on such an illustrious pod podcast, and uh, I hope uh, your uh, listeners uh, enjoy uh, our conversation today. I do too. All right, so David is the author of two books, Godless Grace and Darwin's Apostles, and he's got some other things he's working on, but he's here to talk to us today about his work uh, in the area of humanism. So David, why don't you start, start off, just maybe tell a little bit about, about yourself first, and then we can move into uh, the work you do. Okay, I hope no one, if I'm, if I'm giving my biography, I hope no one swipes right. <laughs> um, so, uh, as Jason mentioned, I'm an, uh, I'm an anthropologist. I teach uh, mostly undergraduates at City University of New York at Medgarivers College. Uh, I've been on faculty for about uh, 20 years or so at various institutions. And um, my work has uh, primarily been involved in primate behavior. Um, and my ongoing work is really in uh, the study of uh, the atheist humanist uh, skeptic experience in the United States. Um, in my first book, I talk about uh, being good without God and what that means. And it was the book is uh, in Godless Grace is a focus on uh, it's an ethnography, basically, of people from around the world who are doing uh, the good work of trying to uh, help and save the planet, uh, both uh, from a humane point of view, but without a uh, need to be doing this uh, for the sake of uh, pleasing an otherworldly being. Um, and uh, that was a fun book to write and uh, interview so many great people, uh, Dan Barker, uh, for one, uh, a lot of uh, uh, former clergy who became atheists and talking about their experiences, uh, a lot of young atheists, um, who are very much activist even today. Uh, that book came out in 2015. Uh, my uh, newest book that just came out in 2019, uh, in November of 2019, on uh, the anniversary of the, or, uh, the publication of Origin of Species is uh, Darwin's Apostles, which is a book which is pretty much a history of science about Darwin's work and uh, how Darwin himself, after he wrote Origin of Species, really depended on the friendship of uh, many people, but five core people to really get his ideas out and not have them uh, crushed by the uh, church uh, and by uh, religious people in the scientific community of the 19th century. Uh, and so that book, if you're a Beatles fan, is really characterized as being um, a book about, you know, getting by with a little help from my friends. So people like uh, Joseph Hooker, uh, uh, John Draper, uh, Huxley, uh, T.H. Huxley, uh, Al Alfred Russell Wallace, who's the co-discoverer of, uh, of uh, natural selection, uh, um, uh, and, and several others uh, are highlighted in the book. And the book also looks at what's happening in the world today because the same things that plagued us in the 19th century about anti-science, uh, trust in God, the 6,000 year old planet versus understanding science and how long, how old this planet is and, and its history and the universe's history, uh, how those things are still happening in the United States and around the globe uh, with um, anti-evolution bills uh, having stickers put on bill on on books saying that uh, evolution is just a quote unquote theory um, when when you misinterpret what it is when we talk about when we, in science when we talk about uh, theory. Um, so the other thing that I do is I do a lot of human rights work uh, for about five years. I was the American Humanist Association representative to the United Nations, working with several groups uh, to advocate for. Uh, non-believers in uh, other countries 
uh, and their uh, human and civil rights, which mesh meshes with not only the uh, United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, but also uh, the Atheist uh, uh, Manifesto uh, Three, which also dovetail very nicely. So there's a lot of things um, uh, that I'm interested in. Uh, and uh, that's sort of a mini biography, which I probably went on too long anyway. No worries. Yeah, you, know, you mentioned Huxley. I, I, I'm fond of the quote by Huxley. I, correct me if I'm wrong. I think it was the Oxford debates where he was some minister challenged Huxley to say, like, well, which, which uh, ancestor are you descended from a monkey from your grandmother or your grandfather? And mm -hmm. Huxley, re Huxley retorted, about the, you know, I would rather be a man of ability, you know, be descended from an ape than to use, be a man of ability. He uses talents to suppress the truth, to exactly. you know, paraphrase. So I love that quote. So Yeah, yeah, that, that you know, there, there was an actual uh, transcription of that debate. It, it was reported on afterwards, so there's never, there wasn't a live transcription, but there was, you know, that is definitely one that really hits, hits home. Um, and that was, of course, uh, that was, that was the, it's characterized as the Huxley Wilberforce debate, uh, right. but uh, there were other people who spoke in defense of Darwin that day as well, including Joseph Hooker and uh, John Draper, uh, who was British and moved to America and actually founded, I think it was um, Cornell University, I believe, or it might have been NYU. A medical school. I can't remember the two, so I apologize to either NYU Medical School or Cornell if I got that wrong. Okay, and uh, yeah, so you mentioned some of the the evolutionary uh, school board issues. So um, I I was actually living in in Kansas City back in the in the late '90s when the the Kansas State Board of Education banned it the first time. And for those who don't know the story or the backstory. Mm -hmm that that's what actually ignited the whole flying spaghetti monster debate when they were like, oh, teach the controversy, so why aren't they teaching? So for people who don't understand, that's where the flying spaghetti monster came from, was one of these state board of educations that who had banned evolution. Uh, and they did it again, like I think in 2005 or so, but I know that like Dover, Pennsylvania was around 2005 as well. Yeah. Uh, the, have, have there been some more recent ones? Uh, yeah, have there there, been there have been attempts. Uh, there are ongoing attempts. Uh, uh, you know, the... Uh, the uh, rather nefarious Discovery Institute uh, yeah. o is always looking for uh, enablers uh, or enablers are always looking to the Discovery Institute to help them write uh, core legislation, which they can then just, you know, fill in the blanks and then uh, deposit uh, for a legislative review in different states uh, to uh, have uh, uh, to teach the controversy, as you say or to try to give equal footing to things like intelligent design, which time and time again in the US courts uh, shows that it is not science, it is a form of religion and a very specific form of religion. <laughs> um, and so these are ongoing um, uh, and uh, something we have to be very, very mindful of because, uh, you know, I think one of the, one of the, uh, accepted ideas, although it's never really talked about, is is really trying to is is for the other side to e exhaust people like uh, me and you and other uh, atheists and scientific activists that we would just throw in the towel because it's just a constant drumbeat of trying to get their will through the legislation, and so. Um, you know, another important thing to me is being a link in the chain. And so reporting on this, being active and outspoken uh, against this, uh, while also trying to uh, bring, you know, uh, younger people into the movement, uh, not as a form of indoctrination, but as a form of trying to maintain, you know, a secular, humanist, atheist uh, worldview, which I think and my own bias, of course, is that it is the worldview that is closest to getting us to some type of non-tribal acceptance and peace. Right. Yeah, we had Stephen Picker on a couple of weeks ago and, and his book, Enlightenment Now, he makes that point about how humanism is where societies converge. So have you, yeah, have you done mean, quite a bit of research? I'm sorry? 
So you, you, yeah, so you research on humanism. So has has your own research been pointing in that same direction that humanism is a is a if you boil things down, humanism is sort of what's at the core of our morality and and ethical ethics. Yeah, I mean, it's a very interesting topic uh, because, you know, you could look at, you know, the writings of, of, of some giants, right? Like Carl Sagan, you know, writing about uh, the importance of science and the importance of democracy, that you can't have good science without democracy. Well, you can't have good secular humanism without some form of democracy as well. That anything, you know, anything else probably won't fit as a political system necessarily. And maybe that's not 100% true, um, but I, I find in my uh, own research that where uh, the ideas of secular humanism and tandem to that non-belief uh, grow and flourish are in places where there are um, uh, nations and states and areas that have, you know, uh, more peaceful uh, populations um, and uh, live long, people live longer and healthier. Um, and uh, so Pinker is definitely uh, uh, on the right uh, track when he writes these things. And uh, I've certainly been uh, impacted by his writing. And even in my own research, I mean, going back to Godless Grace, I mean, uh, yes, there are people who are motivated by faith and who will do good things. Uh, but I think that it's uh, a much cleaner and uh, healthier way of viewing the world to be doing it for goodness sake rather than godness sake. Um, and, and the people who I've interviewed for um, uh, my books have always um, seen, that has always sort of been the core, whether it's people are trying to save the spotted owl or, you know, deal with food insecurity or, um, um, homelessness or any other uh, uh, issue is that people are trying to um, help the world in the now for no other reward other than making the world safer, richer, and kinder for all of us collectively. And, you know, religion might give us some lip service towards that. Uh, but if you look at what happens boots on the ground, um, I personally can't uh, see how uh, a faith-based perspective uh, will lead to the same healthy outcomes. Uh, there's there's lip service, there's talk about it, uh, but when you look at some of the many of the crises in the world, um, uh, it's humanism rather than uh, religiosity, which uh, is the bandage that leads to healing. I like that. Sure. Okay. Yeah. And so, um, I had a I had a question on the tip of my tongue, but now I no forgot problem. what it was. Uh, oh yeah. So would you? No, no. Maybe we'll talk about it offline. I don't know. Okay. Uh, oh. Okay. So. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, go ahead. If I don't mind uh, mentioning, uh, I'm uh, very uh, uh, humbly and proudly a uh, new board member to AAI uh, as oh, well. Okay. And I didn't know that. Yes. Um, okay. I'm, I'm on the advisory committee as of uh, late last year. I was asked to join and I'm up on AAI's website. And so I hope to be a change agent uh, there uh, as well, uh, because I think that AAI in its work towards uh, human and civil rights for non-believers is critical uh, just as Freedom From Religion Foundation, um, uh, American Atheists, American Humans Association, all of the other secular groups in the United States are working there. You know, AAI is really working internationally. And I, I really respect uh, the mission and uh, the very positive history of uh, AI as well. Good, thanks. Yeah, I didn't, I know the, the advisory council mostly reports to the president. So I've, I've seen yeah. the names on the list, but you know, it's been several months since I've looked at it. So I apologize that I didn't know that. So. No, it's okay. Oh, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm, like I said, I'm, I'm new. So, you know, I, I, um, I know that, uh, you know, AI has a very long history. Um, there have been, uh, uh, you know, times of uh, concern and uh, times of a real growth, and I hope that by me joining the board, uh, that uh, 
you know, I'm going to help usher in a time where I could use my skills to uh, foster uh, real positive growth for AI as well. Oh, that would be good. You know, we need, we need some good positive growth so so we can help more people, especially where we're being like the Atheist Support Network is is literally bombarded with requests from mostly from people living in Muslim countries or sure. even even in a, in a Western country, but with, with a Muslim family uh, who just they feel trapped, you know, that they, they can't live their truth and be open about mm -hmm. who they are in their family or their society about being a free thinker about you know, serious risk to their 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 lives or their mental health. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. be, be good to, to see some of that uh, progress. So. Yeah, absolutely. Because, I mean, we really didn't see it. Um, when I was uh, at the United Nations, there was um, um, concern, of course, always spoken out at these meetings. And, but it was never any more than, uh, sadly, um, uh, lip service, which sort of gets drowned out with all the other intra-religious fighting that goes on. You know, I when working for the United Nations on the freedom of... Uh, uh, what is it, the uh, uh, for, uh, freedom of religion or belief, uh, you, it was this round table of all these other faith groups, including atheists and non-believers, um, all sharing stories of how some other religion <laughs> has ostracized or caused pain because they didn't accept my such and such beliefs. Uh, what I really like about uh, AAI is that it really does not only talk about how it, almost exclusively what happens when the religious state or religious authorities uh, deny uh, non-believers their human and civil rights uh, to speak out, uh, is that there's a, an activist edge to AAI, uh, which, which does my heart good, uh, because we need to constantly be either put our energies or our money uh, or our political influence uh, towards people uh, who, uh, Jason, like you say, who are trapped uh, in families or in communities or in nations uh, where they cannot be who they hope to be in this world. And we know as non-believers, this is our only time around. You know, we're not coming back. We're not living on after we cut this mortal coil. And so if this is the only time we have uh, what a tragedy it is for people who are stopped at the border of their own ideas to be able to, you know, express themselves uh, for fear of uh, subjugation, for fear of being ostracized, or for bodily harm. I mean, how could we in the 21st century allow for this uh, to be done? How we can allow um, laws like a blasphemy to be on the books of these nations and not call them out as well it's just that and i'm an anthropologist i'm just you know that's just their culture we have to respect that no i don't think that that's the case at all that we can't be so relativistic uh that we can't speak out and say no there are collective truths um uh, and there are human truths uh, that 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 can be violated um, and uh, and need to be stopped from being violated. Yeah, and that kind of goes to your point earlier about how you know democracy is where you see humanism flourishing, whereas in theocracies, right. obviously, it's uh, it's in some of those countries, it's probably banned outright. To be, yeah, to and be, you always you know, tend to find. Um, I mean, look at uh, even. Uh, uh, in this, in the United States, you know, the evangelical movement has sort of fit very, very snugly and rightly uh, with um, the current Republican Party. You yeah. know, there's this connection. If you go to Russia, you see that the Russian Orthodox Church and Putin are built together very, very nicely. So where yeah. you have potential or real um, actors and governments uh, that seek to stop people from their individual and collective futures, uh, you find that if you scratch the surface, uh, that that uh, authoritarianism is usually backed up by some 
religious entity or organization saying, yeah, go ahead, keep going, keep going. Yeah. yeah I mean, just reminded, the Catholic yeah. Church and Hitler um, were, were, were together also. Uh, maybe they, you know, it was, uh, that's not to say that there weren't people of goodwill, uh, Christians who saved um, Jews and gypsies and people like that, but their organizations, the priests were all hiling Hitler. Yeah, yeah. I'm reminded now your point about like the the, the two of them go together. Uh, but a year ago, we had the Burmese atheists on, and they were talking about how the the ultra conservative uh, Buddhist uh, monks are supporting the coup in the military because mm -hmm. they don't they don't want to see a democratic society and a secular society. They they like things the way it is, and they want to keep the status quo. So they're they're supporting the military coup and all their human rights abuses, and it's 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 appalling. So. Yeah, you know, it's, it's so it's, it's, as Hitchin said, you know, religion really does poison everything. I mean, it I does. have to step back. I mean, this is, of course, me talking. Uh, this is not City University of New York talking or my college talking or AI talking. Um, uh, so this is my own personal point of view. Um, uh, and, and so, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I see that uh, when I wear my anthropologist hat, of course, you know, we have to talk uh, and often and I often do about how um, religious belief uh, has existed um, for thousands of years. And there have been thousands of gods and even Neanderthals uh, had a belief in afterlife. So um, the meta metaphysics of religion um, might in some way be inbred in us. However, in the 21st century, because of the Enlightenment, as we talked about, I think, before we started uh, uh, recording, uh, but definitely throughout history, there have been people who uh, would be very supportive of AAII 2,000 years ago in Greece and Rome and uh, all these places, uh, even in the Muslim world uh, or the Arabic world, I should say. Um, and... Um, would uh, want to uh, see the uh, the world uh, from the point of view of the secular humanist slash atheist. It, it always gets me that we we somehow leave wonder at the door, um, and and I'm always thinking about. Um, there, there's this thing for, you know, we tend to be now as a species, we're really starting to go off the world. You know, we're sending William Shatner up to out of space and we're sending billionaires up there and people with a lot of money. Eventually other people will be able to go as well as this becomes more commercially viable. But there's a, um, an effect uh, that people who get to go to the um, uh, outer lens of the atmosphere and look back upon Earth and have what's called the overview effect, mm -hmm. uh, where you look and you see how small the planet truly is in the context of the in, in, in encroaching galaxy and universe, and it puts you at peace. I think we need to have a lot more of that overview effect now. And I think that's the thing that religion fails to give that I think that the humanist and the atheist point of view, the non-belief point of view, tends to usher in. That even if we don't leave the planet, we're smart enough and we acknowledge enough um, that we are just here for a very brief amount of time on this small little blue dot that is in this immense universe. Uh, and that if if we're going to matter in our times in a peaceful way, then to encourage that is to do it in a way that allows us all to live as freely uh, as possible. And I think that is what humanism and secular humanism and atheism is all about. Yeah, I've, I've read about the overview effect. And I mean, I understand it intuitively. 
Mm -hmm. And I'm sure the astronauts who've gone up understood it intuitively as well. But Absolutely. yet there was something about the experience that was still transformational, even though they knew it before. So, right. Because is that something as an anthropologist you can explain, like why? you know, We understand it, but what what is it about the experience that is so transformational? I think that it is the enormity of the fact that we understand things intellectually um, and that we carry them with us and we might actually take action based on these things. But once we are in a position where we physically experience it, it becomes more real. So for you and I, we understand, accept, and are probably even excited by the overview effect and what the implications are for humanity. Uh, but for the lucky few right now who have gone up there and actually have their, their perspectives have changed, you know, their lives have changed because they've looked back. And if you go back to, again, and I'll mention because Carl Sagan for me has always been um, a bellwether of, um, of, of human thought and, uh, and kindness, uh, you know, this whole idea of, you know, turning back the Voyager spacecraft and seeing this little dot and saying, that's us, that's now, you know, all the people that have ever lived, uh, you know, all the, all the leaders who wanted to take over did so for a speck of a, of a piece of dust. And so that perspective, I think, is ingrained in us when we acknowledge our non-belief um, and it is ingrained in us uh, when we accept um, the, su the, the meaning and purpose of a scientific uh, worldview, which is actually not cold, but in my point of view, much more exciting than any faith or faith tradition could ever experience. When you right. think about the enormity of the universe and what science is telling us uh, through our understanding of physics and cosmology, um, uh, the Drake equa equation alone, uh, we, we just sent up this brand new telescope. Um, you know, we, we went from, this is the thing that I love so much about being human as well, um, is that we've gone from 1912 for the first or 1905, excuse me, I'm trying to remember when Orville and Wilbur Wright Three, flew with the City Hall. Um, 1903. 1903 to uh, in a hundred years seeing, send, sending our, ourselves up in these ships <laughs> um, to, to other planets, you know, first to the moon and now we're planning to go to Mars and we're sending, we're sending these technologies, whether it be the Voyager spacecraft or the, the Hubble telescope or the new telescope that, um, that just went up, these are emissaries for our collective humanity. Um, they will, they may encounter uh, beings uh, in other galaxies uh, that it may be a thousand or two thousand years from now, but it will be these things that are so new to us now, and this is, brings us back to anthropology, will be the archaeological evidence for our existence two and three and five and 10,000 years into the future. Just like when we dust off um, um, uh, a, a fossil, uh, or a rock and say, or, or a pot and say, oh, something existed here. We are now putting our stamp on the universe. Uh, and it's very exciting because this is the evidence, um, as Carl Sagan said, you know, humans exist for the universe to know itself. Um, we are making, we will be making contact in ways uh, that our future generations will be the, hopefully, if the people who come and visit us or the people or the beings that come and visit us have good intentions rather than bad intentions, uh, will be the beneficiaries of our actions now. 
So all this archaeological stuff that we're putting up into the universe expresses who we are today, and it's very exciting. Yeah, and as the, I, I know some atheists have speculated that you know when an alien civilization does arrive, what does that mean for religion here? You know, mm -hmm. especially something like you know I, I did a meme a few years ago, and I called it the 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 theory of special Christian relativity that, you know, <laughs> Christianity basically thinks, you know, you have to believe that Jesus sacrificed for you. Well, an right. alien civilization, God is supposed to be universal. So, you know, obviously an alien civilization in, an, in another solar system has never going to have heard of Jesus and his sacrifice. And so mm -hmm. what does that mean to a universal God? So, mm -hmm. Well, you know, the whole idea is that we're made in his image. Well, what if the creatures that come, you know, look like, uh, um, this flying spaghetti monster or 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 aren't even carbon-based life forms maybe they're silica-based life forms does that mean that god is silicate <laughs> and not carbon um so there are so many holes that you can drive through most religious doctrine uh um, that uh to be a rationalist uh or a non-believer uh, that they're easy to see that people who have their blinders on will not see whatsoever. I think, who was it that, um, trying to remember, uh, uh, was it um, uh, Sam Harris or, or Jerry Coyne uh, talked not that long ago about a, a survey uh, of, of some religious people uh, and, and uh, the, uh, the survey asked, well, what if there was absolute obtainable evidence that there is in no way possible for there to be a God, as you describe, or any God whatsoever, that science, just as Huxley said about Darwin, natural selection killed God. What if we really do kill God? And it isn't science that kills it, but something just shows that it doesn't exist. Um, 70% of believers, it might have even been 80%, said that they would still believe. And so you've got that uh, innate need to accept the metaphysics of the world as real rather than the physics of the world, whether it be for cultural reasons, comfort reasons, um, you know, uh, historical reasons, fear, you know, there's there's a lot of things that people who are religious are really fearful of um, that we get to glide sort of by willy-nilly because we just aren't fearful of those same things. Like, I'm afraid we'll blow ourselves up. Uh, I'm not afraid of going to hell because, you know, I... Uh, or being stoned because I don't believe in God, or I decided to wear two types of fabric, <laughs> or, or you know, uh, am cast into uh, the fiery pits of hell because I never accepted any particular deity. Right. So, do you do you think from an from an anthropological point of view, do you think first contact with an alien species will have that sort of overview effect on? at least a significant proportion of like you said like the 70 80 percent would still believe but i would imagine that first contact is is going to shake the faith of of quite a few and how that I, sort of I, I believe it will I, I do do this program which is an anthropologist looks at first contact and i sort of break down the idea of that you know we're, if we're visited uh by uh, an autocratic species or a species that just doesn't even acknowledge us as being worthy of existence um, um, that it won't make a difference what we think because it will they'll annihilate us uh, but if uh, you know the two other groups come which are sort of the uh, idea of uh, the anthropo the anthropo and by the way that first idea is sort of postulated by um, um, the the uh, physicist um, the the astronomer uh, oh, oh, uh, uh, who had uh, a amyotropic lateral sclerosis? Uh, Hawking, Stephen Hawking. Uh, Hawkins, yeah. I'm sorry, I, um, name just flew out of my head. Um, but uh, you know, if if the people, if if those who come who are just observers, 
like anthropologists, the credo of anthropology, especially cultural anthropology, is to observe but not intervene, right? Um, you know, that's sort of the Star Trekian version of things. You know, the prime directive, the first directive is to, you know, not involve yourself, not try to, you know, make these people who are, you know, they would see us as maybe the, you know, the, the, the Anamamo or something like that. Don't give them the iPod. <laughs> you know, don't give them the tech. Now let them just grow and progress. Um, that, so that's the second version. The, the third version is the Carl Sagan version, which is, you know, people, um, these aliens come and they want to share and they want to be uh, paternal to us and they want us to be part of a wider uh, universal civilization uh, as equals, uh, not be seen as children and not be seen as food or slaves. Um, so uh, when I write about this, uh, there is, I think most of the population, depending on how governments handle this, and by the way, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, uh, but you know, it's very clear that there are a lot of governments that are intensely um, collecting data, uh, even, even the United States government, uh, which just released uh, not that long ago, uh, data on uh, unidentified uh, objects, uh, which they've come and not um, come out and say, yeah, this is something. But the current director of NASA said it would be foolish to think that we aren't being visited or that we won't be visited uh, in the near future. Um, but I, I do think that those who are best suited, and I think when I mean best suited, I mean atheists, agnostics, humanists, rationalists, skeptics, will be best suited to deal with the discovery or uncovery of alien life when it comes to the earth than people who are um, believers in whatever religious faith tradition because just the immediate existence of these alien civilizations will call into question all of their beliefs. And what will happen is my idea of the census of that is probably a third of believers. Uh, and there's, you know, 2 million Christians, the not necessarily Catholics, but Christians, 2 billion, 2.2 billion uh, Christians in the world, about a, a billion Muslims in the world. And, um, uh, thousands of other religions, probably about a third of that, that inf those people will give up their faith. Uh, another third will try to uh, assume somehow in the scripture the reason for these beings to exist. Um, and because it's so subjective anyway, and religion is so pliable that way that anything new, you know, Galileo was imprisoned. Darwin, they tried to disrespect Darwin. Now the, every, well, you know, the, the, except for the evangelicals, most of the churches accept these aspects of science and they put it into, well, God's the first cause, you know. Um, so there's that third that will somehow um, accept that we live in a, a world that God created those things too. And therefore my faith is still valid. And then there will be a third who will um, uh, probably just ignore um, um, this uh, this event when it does happen, uh, and we'll see it as a conspiracy, or, or will not not be able to. You know, they'll have the blinders on so tightly that any aspect of evidence will only further push them further deeper into uh, uh, their belief system, closing them off to the world rather than exposing them to it. It's like going to the uh, Ark Park uh, or the, you know, the, uh, the, the uh, museum, you know, Ken Ham's museum. You can fill yourself with all the BS <laughs> and surround yourself by you know intelligent design or biblical creation and ignore 
everything. It doesn't make you right. It might make you comfortable for the time that you're there and validate your beliefs when you leave, but it doesn't make you right. And I think that's what will happen with that third group of people when we do make contact. Yeah. I think Ken, there was some comment about Ken Ham made in the last year, couple of years about when aliens arrived that they would be Christians or something, something, <laughs> you know, correspondingly stupid that everything that comes out of, out of Ken Ham and, <laughs> and answers in Genesis. So. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I know. You got to just shake your head. Yeah. Well, fortunately, the, the Pew surveys are showing that the evangelicals are on the decline in the U.S. So, you know, within the next generation, we should see a, hopefully a big shift in, in U.S. Um, socio-political uh, issues, you know, around this if, as the evangelicals lose their, their political power. So. Yeah, I mean, I think that's part of the culture wars that are happening now in the United States. You know, it started probably in the 1980s. It might have even gone back to the 1960s. But I think you can firmly put a, a, a flag in the sand of about the 1980s during the quote unquote Reagan revolution, uh, where you see evangelicals really with their game plan that is was very clear. Well, that, that, was, that was the three Republican strategists who they allied with. Jerry Falwell's moral majority. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, moral majority. That's, so that's where that came from. That, that, yes, absolutely. The, the, this inbuilt sort of conservative base. And then the, the Republican Party has just been downhill ever since. In, absolutely. You know, creation absolutely. or, you know, uh, evolution denial and science denial and, you know, alternative facts that we see today. And so, Taking away women's right to choose. Gay rights. You know, I mean, we, we, we in the states here are, you know, very concerned. You've got a, cons a very conservative Supreme Court, uh, which uh, may affect uh, Roe v. Wade uh, rather permanently uh, in uh, the next uh, year or so. And, um, you know, I, I, I fault um, uh, Trump as much as I, uh, but I really, you know, fault Mitch McConnell. You know, this is the guy who wouldn't, during Obama's time, wouldn't allow Merrick Garland's nomination to the Supreme Court go forward because, oh, it's a year before the end of the election and, um, and uh, we, we don't want to do that, even though there's no rule that says you shouldn't do that and Obama didn't nominate Garland. And then six weeks before the election, um, when uh, RGB passes away, boom, you know, they squeak that in under uh, and really do change the, uh, the courts. Yeah. Um, and they don't see the hypocrisy of doing that where, where they, they prevented Obama, but it was okay for them to do it. So Right, exactly. The hypocrisy that's, is, yeah. that's, the, that's the religious power. That's the theocracy and autocracy that is very, very dangerous. And it can come from the left as much as it can come from the right. I'm not just necessarily saying that it's, you know, I'm not going to just poo poo because I don't want to be uh, so tribal here because we know that uh, regardless of uh, persuasion, um, there, there can be um, the, the same dangers can appear on the left as they can on the, uh, yeah. on the right. We're, we're seeing that with the radical left and the, the cancel culture and silencing of dissent or differing opinions. On and, campuses and things like that. Yeah. yeah, that there are people who are so quote unquote woke um, that any, um, uh, any point of view that is not their own uh, becomes, oh, you're this or you're that or you're well, these other things. And so the whole idea of the, uh, um, academic freedom and intellectual freedom is is in danger uh, on campuses as much sometimes uh, by um, uh, the left as it is um, the right, you know, uh, because any type of radicalization immediately negates a center uh, and immediately looks to make everything tribal. You're either with us or you're against us. You're either part of the problem or part of the solution. There's no nuance. Uh, and so I think to be respectful of each other's humanity, we have to enforce that nuance to keep those discussions going. Um, um, I'm very dear friends with people of um, various religious faiths because I see past their, you know, um, um, their, their beliefs uh, uh, to their 
you know, their, uh, uh, their kindness as human beings. And I'm sure many people who are non-believers have believers in their own family. I have believers in my own family. I don't cut them out because they're believers. If anything, you want to build those bridges uh, and show just as equally that um, uh, humanist atheists can, can be and often are and will be more moral, more ethical. Uh, as the not only the data proves, but um, that that our actions prove on a daily basis. Yeah. Okay. Very good. All right. So we should wrap up here. Anything you'd like to to sum up with, or that's a good good note to end on? I guess we could sort of end here. Uh, you know, Jason, I want to thank you for offering me this opportunity to uh, come on. Uh, for those of of you who I've insulted. I, <laughs> I might be hearing from you. Um, you will probably find me on my website and you can let me know if I've insulted you. If, for those of you who agree with me, um, I can be found on my website and on Facebook and Twitter and all these other fun places. Um, and, you know, the important thing to me as an academic and as an educator and as a secular humanist and atheist is to keep the conversation going. So, you know, uh, and, and to remain positive that way. And I also want to thank AAI for allowing me to come on to the board. Uh, I think it's great and um, um, better days. Okay. Well, thanks for coming on and making the time to chat with us. Okay. So, um, again, everybody, so we'll, we'll put the links to David's website and, and his books uh, in the description. You'll be able to find them there. And as always, we remind everyone to please like and subscribe, and we'll see everybody next time. Take care, everybody, and thanks, David, for coming on. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye, everybody. Okay, thanks for listening and don't forget we're on YouTube, so follow us on YouTube, just search for Atheist Alliance International and please subscribe and hit that notification bell. We're also on all of your favourite podcast platforms, so make sure that you follow us on there as well. See you next time.